if we're going to make use of Chebyshev's bound and other results that depend on the variance, we'll need some methods for calculating varia, variance in various circumstances. So let's develop that here. Uh, a basic place to begin is to ask about the indicator vari about indicator variables and their variance. So remember, I as an indicator variable uh, means that it's 0, 1 valued. It's also called a Bernoulli variable. And if the probability that it equals 1 is p, that's also its expectation. So we have an indicator variable with expectation of the indicator is p, and we're asking what's its variance, which by definition is the expectation of i minus p squared. Well, this is one of these sort of almost mechanical proofs that follows simply by algebra and linearity of expectation. But let's walk through it step by step just to reassure you that that's all that's involved. I would recommend against really trying to memorize this because it's I can never remember it anyway. I just reprove it every time I need it. Um, and so let's see how the proof would go. So step one would be to um, expand this i minus p squared algebraically. So we're talking about the expectation of i squared minus 2pi plus p squared. Now we can just apply linearity of expectation, and I get the expectation of i squared minus 2p times the expectation of i plus p squared. Of course, the expectation of a constant is the constant. So when I take expectation of p squared, I get p squared. But now look at this. i squared is 0, 1 valued. So in fact, i squared is equal to i. And the expectation of i has now appeared here. That's p. So this term simplifies to expectation of i. And this term becomes 2p times p plus p squared. Of course, that expectation of i is a p. So I got p minus 2p squared plus p squared. Uh, the p squareds cancel. And I get p minus p squared. If you factor out p, that's p times 1 minus p or pq, which is the standard way that you write the variance of an indicator variable. It's p times 1 minus p. OK, that was easy and, again, completely mechanical. Um, there is a couple of other rules for calculating variance for, uh, of new variables from old ones that are basic, like additivity of expectation, but it doesn't quite work so simply for variance. So the first rule is that if you ask about the variance of a constant times r plus b, that turns out to be the same as a squared times the variance of b, of r. The b doesn't, additive b doesn't matter, and the because the variance is really the expectation of something squared when you uh, get rid of that constant a, you're factoring out an a squared. And this is the rule that you get here. OK. Um, another basic rule that's often convenient, instead of working with variance in the form of the expectation of uh, r minus mu squared, is to say that it's the expectation of r squared minus the square of the expectation of r. Now this uh, expression, the square of the expectation of r, comes up so often that there's a shorthand for it where instead of writing parens, you write e squared of r. It just means the same as expectation of r squared. And so much for the second rule, which we'll use all the time because it's a convenient rule to have. I'm going to prove the second one just again to show you nothing to worry about. You don't even have to remember how the proof goes because you can reconstruct it every time. So this, it's again simple proofs just by linearity of expectation and doing the algebra. So the variance of r is by definition the expectation of r minus mu squared. Let's expand r minus mu squared. It's the expectation of r squared minus 2 mu r plus mu squared. Now we apply linearity to that. I get the expectation of r squared minus 2 mu expectation of r plus the expectation of mu squared, if I'm really being completely mechanical about linearity of expectation. Now expectation of a constant mu squared is simply mu squared. And here I've got the expectation of r. That's mu again. So I wind up with the expectation of r squared minus 2 mu mu plus r squared. The, this is 2 mu squared, minus 2 mu squared plus mu squared. It winds up with minus mu squared. And of course, mu squared is the expectation squared of r. I've proved the formula. Uh, again, as claimed, there's nothing interesting here, just algebra and linearity of expectation. And the first result about factoring out an a and squaring it uh, follows from a similar proof, which I'm not going to include here. 
So let's look at the space station mirror again, which we used as an example of uh, calculating mean time to failure. So the hypothesis that we're making is that with probability p, the Muir space station will uh, run into some huge uh, space garbage that will clobber it. Uh, and the probability of that happening in any given hour is probability p. So we know that that means that the expected uh, number of hours for the mere to fail is 1 over p. That's the mean time to failure. And what we're asking is, what's the variance of f? If f is the number of hours to failure, what's variance of f? Well, uh, one way we can do it is just plug in the uh, definition of expectation, and this will work. The probability that, the, that it takes k hours to fail is we know the geometric distribution, the probability of not failing for k minus 1 hours and failing after that, q to the k minus 1 times p. So the variance of f, using our uh, previous formula about the expectation of f squared minus the expectation squared of f, this becomes a minus 1, 1 over p squared. And we can forget about that. We want to focus on calculating the expectation of f squared. So f is 1, 2, 3, and so on. That means f squared is 1, 4, 9, k squared. The point being that uh, the only values that f squared can take are squares, so we don't have to worry about uh, counting them in in the sum that defines the expectation. So let's go look at that. Um, so the expectation of f squared is the sum over the possible values that f squared can take, namely the sum from k equals 1 to infinity of k squared times the probability that f squared is equal to k squared. Well, of course, the probability that f squared is equal to k squared is the same as the probability that f equals k. Um, so I uh, can, and we know what the probability that f equals k is. It's a geometric distribution. So the probability that f equals k is uh, q to the k minus 1 times p. If I factor out a p over q, this simplifies to the sum from k equals 0 to infinity of k squared q to the k. And this is a, a kind of sum that we've seen before, and it has a closed form. And we could perfectly well calculate then the expectation of f, f squared by uh, appealing to our generating function information to get a closed form for this, and then remember to subtract 1 minus p squared because uh, the variance is this term minus the square of the expectation of f. But let's go another way and use the same technique of total expectation that we used before. Uh, that is, the expectation of f squared, of the failure time squared, is equal by the law of total probability to the expectation of f squared given that f is 1, that is we fail after the, on the first step, times the probability that we fail on the first step, plus the expectation of f squared given that we don't fail on the first step, that f is greater than 1, times the probability that f is greater than 1. Now, what's going to make this manageable is that this expression, the expectation of f squared when f is greater than 1, will turn out to be something that we can easily convert uh, into a non-conditional probability and find a value for. So the lemma that we're using here is the following. When I'm thinking about mean time to failure, if I think of any function whatsoever, g of the mean time to failure, and I'm interested in the expectation of g of f, and I'm interested in the expectation of g of f given that f is greater than n, that is, it's already taken n steps to get where I am, then the thing about the mean time to failure is that at any moment um, what, that you haven't failed, you're starting off in essentially the same situation you were at the beginning in waiting for the next failure to occur. And the probability of failing in one more step is uh, the same probability, is the same p, and the probability of your failing in two more steps is qp, and three more steps is q qp. The only difference is that the value of f has been shifted by n. It was in the ordinary case, we start off with f equals 0 and look at the probability that we fail in one more step, two more steps. Now we're starting off with f having the value f plus n and asking about the probability that it fails in the next step or the next step or the next step. So the punchline is that the expectation of g of f given that f is greater than n is simply the expectation of g of f plus n. And I'm going to let you meditate that and not say any more about it. But the punchline is the corollary that the expectation of f squared 
given that f is greater than 1 is simply the expectation of f plus 1 squared. And that lets us go back and simplify this expression that we had from total expectation. We now have, here's the f, uh, expectation of f squared given that f is greater than 1. And let's look at these other terms. This is the expectation of f squared given that f equals 1. Well, the expectation of f squared given that f equals 1 is 1 squared because we know what f is and that's the end of the story, times the probability that f equals 1, that's p, the probability of failure on a given step. This is the probability that f is greater than 1, which is q, that we didn't fail on the first step, and we just figured out that this term is the expectation of the square of f, uh, of f plus 1. So there's the 1 and the p and that becomes a q, and this is the expectation of f plus 1 squared. Now again, I apply lim linearity. I'm going to expand f plus 1 squared into um, f squared uh, plus 2f plus 1, and then apply linearity of expectation, and I'm going to wind up with the expectation of f squared plus twice the expectation of f, which remember is twice over 2 over p, plus 1 times the q. And now what I've got is a simple uh, arithmetic equation between the expectation of f squared and some other arithmetic and the expectation of f squared. It's easy to solve for the expectation of f squared, and I'll spare you that uh, elementary simplification. But the punchline is when we also remember to subtract uh, 1 over uh, p squared, because that was the expectation of the square of f, of the expectation of f, we come up with this punchline formula. The variance of mean time to failure is 1 over the probability of failure on a given step times 1 minus 1 over the, uh, times the probability, 1 over the probability of the failure in the first step minus 1. All right, let's just for practice and fun, let's look at the space station Mir again. Um, suppose that I tell you that there's a 1 in 10,000th chance that uh, in any given hour, the Mir is going to crash into some debris that's out there in orbit. Now, so the expectation of f is uh, 10 to the fourth, about uh, 10,000 hours. Uh, and the sigma um, is going to be the variance of, of f, which is about 1 over uh, 1 ten thousandth, that is 10,000 times 10,000 minus 1, which is pretty close to 10,000 squared for the variance. And then when I take the square root, I get back to 10,000. So sigma is just a tad less than, than 10,000. It's 10 to the fourth. So with those numbers, I can apply the Chebyshev theorem and conclude that the probability that the mere lasts more than 4 times 10 to the fourth hours is less than 1 chance in 4. Uh, if we translate that into years, uh, if it was really the case that there was a 1 in 10,000 chance of the mirror being destroyed in any given hour, then the probability that it lasts more than 4.6 years before destructing is less than one quarter. So another rule for calculating variance, uh, and the, maybe the most important general one, is that variance is additive. That is, the variance of a sum is the sum of the variances. But unlike expectation, where there's no other side condition and it does not in any way depend on independence, it turns out that variance is additive only if the variables being added are pairwise independent. Now, you might wonder where the pairwise came from, and it's because a variance is the square of an expectation. So when you uh, wind up multiplying out and doing the algebra, you're just getting quadratic terms that you uh, for pro variances of for expectations of Ri times Rj, and so you need to factor those into ex uh, into expectation of R times expect Ri times expectation of Rj, which you only need pairwise independence for. So that's a fast talking through the algebra that I'm going to leave to you. It's in the text, and it's again one of these easy proofs.